Great. Well, Mia, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. As you mentioned, we're going to talk about three critical concepts guiding management of skeletal metastatic disease. My name is Matt Thompson. I'm an orthopedic oncologist. I practice at the University of Washington and also the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center and also direct the orthopedic oncology fellowship. I have no disclosures relevant to this topic. Jumping right in, when we see a malignant tumor in bone, I was taught and, and passed along to our trainees that the first three things we should think about are metastatic disease. So METS, 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 myeloma, lymphoma, and everything else. <clears throat> metastatic disease is extremely common. And in 2020, there are 1.8 million new diagnoses of cancer in the United States. And we know that over half of those tumors will metastasize to bone. And so the orthopedic surgeon is often an integral component, not only of recognition of uh, potentially metastatic cancer, but also the initiation of workup and or uh, palliative care. And what I'll say is, is as time goes on, the, the dogma that surrounded um, orthopedic oncology and metastatic disease for a long time is changing. It's becoming more nuanced because our medical oncology colleagues are, are finding new and better ways to treat uh, metastatic cancer and prolonged survival. That being said, it's not changing quickly. The median cancer drug development cost is around $650 million. And only about one in 10 drugs in general make it from phase one to FDA approval. And oncology actually is the um, lowest of all therapeutic classes at around 5%. And so, for example, immunotherapy drugs, uh, which have been heralded as, as game changers in many situations, do not work for the majority of patients and may only be effective in about 13% of patients who receive them. And so um, even though there's reason to be optimistic and there's promise in the future, it remains that the survival when carcinoma becomes metastatic is, is a poor prognosis and survival is poor. So as orthopedic surgeons, our job is to try to recognize those situations where that's not the case um, using the techniques we'll talk about to identify situations where there may be a uh, projected longer survival and, and uh, a need for choosing a more durable orthopedic construct to, to prevent fracture or treat a pathologic fracture. <clears throat> so in that way, a thoughtful, a thoughtful orthopedic surgeon can make a major impact on a patient's uh, survivorship um, by reducing morbidity, preventing suffering, and improving pain, by sparing function, and perhaps most importantly, maintaining or improving independence and quality of life, but also at times recognizing those situations where surgery is not indicated, and we should shift our focus to humane, uh, holistic uh, end-of-life care. And so as I approach these clinical problems on a daily basis, I try to try to go about it really by thinking about three critical concepts. First, I want to understand the patient. I want to understand the disease and the justifications for intervention or non-intervention. I really try to view that through a biopsychosocial uh, frame of reference to try to understand the patient holistically. I think the second critical concept is we need to communicate. We're in an era where we can't stay up to date on all the information. And it's important to communicate with the medical oncologist, especially to try to reconcile the patient's oncologic uh, and orthopedic goals of care. And then finally, it's hard to talk about uh, metastatic disease in 15 minutes and, and endow all the surgical principles one needs to be effective in that realm, but we'll talk about some key principles that you can use to approach these clinical problems uh, in general terms. So jumping into the first one, obviously, as with any orthopedic patient, we want to complete a complete uh, history and physical exam, but really focus on the social history. Uh, that's, this is where I think we really uncover the most information that's gonna help us help our patient make a decision that's right for them at the time. So we're gonna talk about their current living situation, their functional uh, level and their aspirations. What do they wanna do and what kind of support do they have in their home environment to accomplish those goals? And then I think equally important is assessing their level of medical literacy and really bringing that conversation to them. Um, while assessing their value, values, their risk tolerance, and their decision-making paradigm as we present options for treatment or non-treatment. Really the first step after you've recognized the malignant bone tumor is to form a staging workup. And through this landmark article in 1993 out of, the, um, out of Chicago, we know that if we complete standard labs, chest X-ray, CT cap, bone scan, and a biopsy of the most accessible lesion, we're likely to come up with the answer, the, the primary cancer type. And in the current era, we might add some additional cancer markers to that workup, but in general, that remains the standard workup for metastatic cancer. Once we've completed that staging workup, we need to start thinking about biopsy. And I think the first question we wanna ask is, if this does turn out to be a sarcoma, so if we're looking at an isolated tumor that's malignant, if this does turn out to be a sarcoma, am I gonna be the one that's gonna treat that? And if the answer is no, then the next step is to refer that patient to the center that's going to treat the patient because Biopsy placement is critical, so we can manage that at the time of definitive treatment. 
And when that is not uh, performed, we know that, that has a, a severely negative impact on not only patient survivorship and outcome, but also our ability to perform limb salvage versus amputation. If we're talking about a different circumstance where the disease is metastatic, then we wanna to try to minimize morbidity by biopsying the most accessible lesion. And if fixation is warranted and you're in a center where you have a capable uh, histologist who can differentiate between carcinoma and sarcoma, then it might be humane to consider doing fixation under, under a single anesthesia. So do a frozen section and base your decisions on that. But I would, I would express extreme caution in that regard and make sure that your pathologist and yourself are comfortable with that assessment. And if there's ever any doubt about the diagnosis or the additional clinical circumstances affecting that decision, then I would say wait for the definitive biopsy result. As we get deep into this workup about what's causing this patient's presentation, we oftentimes forget about the most important thing. The patient came to us uh, as orthopedic surgeons because they had pain, and that pain could be indicative of a risk of fracture. And so as we're getting wrapped up in this workup to find out what the cause is, we often forget the main um, main thing we need to do at that time, which is to protect their weight bearing and, and avoid from making the problem worse. How do we assess the risk of impending fracture? Well, we use scoring criteria in, in, in our best clinical judgment. I think we're all familiar with Muriel's criteria, so to save time, I won't go into depth into that, but I will say that the limitations for Harrington's or Muriel's criteria are that they do, do not account for tumor biology, expected responsiveness to treatment, functional status, the patient's comorbidities or their expected longevity, and in general, perform very well in terms of negative predictive value. In other words, identifying those situations where fracture risk is low, but they perform very poorly uh, in terms of positive predictive value. And if you use the murals criteria strictly, there's a potential to treat over two thirds of your patients. And there are some more exciting technologies coming down the pipeline that we'll hopefully be able to use in the future with better specificity, um, but they're not widely available just yet. And so in practice, clinically speaking, pragmatically, when we when we identify functional pain or pain that gets worse with every step, um, that's, that's uh, considered a, one of the most specific uh, risk factors for an impending fracture. We want to act on that. Why do we treat fractures uh, prophylactically before they actually break? Well, the, that, the answer to that is several fold. We know that fixation of an impending fracture is more cost effective, leads to improved function, decreased blood loss in a shorter operative time, but also oftentimes decreased surgical complexity. So a prophylactic rod is much less morbid for the patient to go through than a proximal femur replacement. So catching that, that bone before it breaks may lead to a less invasive operation. We also know that the ECOG performance score is independently predictive of survival. And so we wanna, we wanna protect that and, and try to keep these patients mobile and independently functional. And even though this is prone to confounding, there's even some evidence that fixing a, a fracture prophylactically uh, is associated with a lower mortality than if that fracture actually goes on to, to break and, and then is treated. So we've evaluated our patient. We understand the risk of fracture and the justifications for treatment if indicated. The next step is to try to understand that particular cancer because as I mentioned at the very beginning, these cancers are all different. We, pro we approach treating them differently. They may respond differently to treatments and, and have different prognoses. And so that's a lot to keep up on, but I would just recommend get, finding a resource that you can use for quick reference when you're on call or in the clinic. And this is just a review article that our team wrote a, a few years ago in Pepperidge. So we've done our work to understand the disease. Now we're gonna move on to communication. And again, most importantly, we wanna communicate with the surgical or the medical oncologist. So we know that surgeons and oncologists alike are bad at predicting survival. Nobody's good at it, it's hard. Um, but having that conversation is important because it helps identify those situations where there might be a, a reason for optimism, a targetable mutation, some sort of patient characteristic that impacts the medical oncologist's ability to treat that cancer. But we also use additional tools. This is a free service called pathfx.org. It's a free, a free registration. Um, and with that, you can input your patient's specific variables and, and predict their survival through two years uh, post-treatment, which is a helpful tool in deciding how to approach their care. The other thing I always talk to the medical oncologist about, even though it's not a medica medication I prescribe, is I recommend considering use of a bone targeted agent like a bisphosphonate because we know that these um, agents help prevent SREs or skeletally related events, such as fracture or hypercalcemia. And then finally, I wanna to talk to the medical oncologist about how my modality is gonna impact their modality. So if we're planning a surgery, we wanna be aware of things like tyrosine kinase inhibitors or any, any medicine that has a, an impact on VEGF or affects the ability of a wound to heal. 
so that we can plan our surgery relative to those treatments or, or, or offer the patient a holiday from those treatments to intervene with, on the fracture. Obviously, we also want to embolize those tumors at high risk of bleeding. And this is just an example on the right of a pathologic fracture due to um, hepatocellular carcinoma, which we do with embolization with uh, cement augmented plate fixation using a carbon fiber implant. And then a, a thyroid a case of thyroid cancer, the acetabulum treated with embolization, uh, curatage, prophylactic fixation of the posterior column, and then a cemented arthroplasty. Finally, we want to consider radiation. So we've, it, we've identified those patients who are at risk of mechanical weakening, and we want to treat those patients surgically. But those patients who are having pain and have a low risk of fracture based on our, our best clinical judgment may benefit from radiation. So we want to involve that team in our discussion because 90% of patients will report at least partial pain relief and up to 50 actually report a uh, period of complete pain relief with radiation alone from metastatic disease to bone. We know that single and multiple fracture regimens are equivalent and that retreatment is safe and efficacious if the patient um, is, continues to have pain after radiation but and remains uh, at a low risk of fracture. So then finally, as I mentioned, we'll try to talk about some very basic principles to uh, use when making decisions about how to approach uh, treating a pathologic fracture. But in general, our surgical construct should allow immediate stability and unrestricted activity. Again, we're trying to protect that ECOG score. We want that patient to function independently. And we also want that construct to outlive the patient's proposed or projected longevity while minimizing morbidity. And I think probably the most, one of the most important aspects of that is recognizing situations where there's a risk that predisposes a patient to reoperation. And renal cell carcinoma is one of the more common ones. So when a patient has a fracture due to renal cell carcinoma, the risk of reoperation is very high. This is just an example of a patient who was treated two years prior to presentation at our center with uh, intramedullary rod for a, a subtrog femur fracture. That didn't work. The nail failed, and they went on to do exchange nailing and a bone grafting procedure, which also did not result in healing. And so he he presented two years into this um, injury, and we treated him with a proximal femur replacement, a segmental reconstruction with a total hip. And in about three months, he was back to climbing in and out of boats and and working in the shop. And so sometimes doing a little bit more invasive procedure, because we recognize the risk of progression is high. Uh, is more palliative and protective of the patient's functional independence. What about what implant to use? So in general, if we're treating uh, a diaphyseal lesion, we will consider an intramedullary rod as an effective technique for that. That's especially true when we're treating cancers that we predict will have a good response to treatment, such as myeloma, lymphoma. Um, so there's actually a possibility that a fracture could heal in that setting, whereas if we're treating renal cell, we may, we may not use a, a, an intramedullary device in the setting of a fracture. The one exception to that is in a patient who's very sick, who has a short life expectancy, even if they're non-mobile, sometimes a femoral rod can be palliative. And so if they have a short life expectancy, that implant only has to last a short time, we might consider that. <coughs> we might also, when we're treating metaphyseal or paraticular disease, consider rather than using a rod or an implant, using cement and a, a locking plate and a buttress type of construct to try to protect that joint, that native joint, and avoid the need for an arthroplasty. In general, we include cement when we're dealing with large areas of bony lysis. That's largely because these devices are used as load sharing devices or designed as load sharing devices to allow fracture healing. In the setting of a pathologic fracture where tumors replace a significant portion of the bone, they become load bearing devices long term and ultimately will fail due to fatigue failure. And so, in those situations, we oftentimes will aug with, augment with cement for initial stability. That's especially true when we have a low anticipated susceptibility of uh, that the tumor has a low, susceptibility, low anticipated susceptibility to treatment, and therefore, fracture healing is unlikely. This is just an example of uh, cement augmentation in a patient with the diaphyseal defect treated with a rod. What about segmental resections and reconstructions? These are the situations where really referral to an orthopedic oncologist may be beneficial to the patient just due to the fre uh, frequency of use. Uh, we consider these as a single definitive treatment when we see severe destruction, where the bone is so severely biomechanically compromised that we can't accomplish a stable, durable construct with cement augmented hardware. Uh, when fracture healing is unlikely again, or in rare circumstances where a metastatectomy may provide the patient a survival benefit. So renal cell carcinoma is the common one that's tested. But there are other situations where for other types of cancer, metastatectomy may actually offer the patient a survival benefit. And for that reason, we might consider a segmental reconstruction. When we're dealing with a patient that's a very high functional demand, we might 
we might uh, err a little bit more on the segmental reconstruction side of uh, treatment over fixation procedures. This is just an example of a proximal humerus pathologic fracture due to metastatic breast cancer. You can see on a cross-sectional imaging that the bone stock was severely um, compromised by the tumor. And we didn't think that a locking plate, even augmented with snow, would have adequate purchase to provide that patient long-term stability. So we treated that with a proximal humerus replacement with reverse total shorter arthroplasty, which is also uh, a nice palliative operation because after a short period of immobilization, we can allow those patients activity as tolerated um, and with good uh, intermediate term survival. What about arthroplasty? When do we talk about doing a joint replacement? Well, when the adjacent joint is at risk um, or there's pre-existing arthritis, we want to choose that durable operation that's going to last forever. And so uh, in that case, we might resort to doing an arthroplasty. The most common example of this is probably femoral neck disease where where there's a high chance of, of our rod failing, we don't have good purchase with our, our, our other implants, or there's a risk that if that disease progresses, the joint could collapse. So we'll go ahead with the cemented arthroplasty. In general, I cement the femoral side and press with the acetabular side when it's possible. And that's because we're gonna radiate this bone and it's not gonna have potential for ongrowth or ingrowth, or it's occupied with tumor. We have to be cognizant of the risk of bone cement implantation syndrome though, because the risks of that potentially deadly disease are most elevated in patients with pathologic fractures, metastatic disease, lung stem, when we use a lung stem prosthesis and when we pressurize. So we wanna be cognizant of that risk and use the lung stem only when it's really truly really indicated. And then finally, when it comes to periacetabular disease, I think the general wisdom is to try not to operate first. So there are other modalities we can use. And that's especially true in treatable tumors like myeloma or lymphoma, where we're gonna protect weight bearing, start systemic therapy, treat the, treat the systemic cancer, and then come back in the future if we need to. But with, with some of these tumors, you'll actually see the bone remodel with time. You can slowly titrate their activity and avoid surgery altogether. When that's not possible, I think there's a major shift to try to do more percutaneous treatments. And so we'll oftentimes try to perform percutaneous radiofrequency ablation followed by balloon assisted osteoplasty um, and then cementation with or without uh, prophylactic column screws. So anytime we can send a patient for this procedure, we've just done an anterior and posterior column screw and a corridor screw. We also can send them for this procedure because you're taking that bone and you're injecting cement into diseased porous bone. There's a risk that could extrapolate into the joint. So in that case, we convert to a cemented total hip replacement. Sometimes we're not that lucky. Sometimes there's no choice but to, but to go all in on an operation like that. Again, so those are general concepts to consider as you're approaching treatment of metastatic disease. And in the paper I mentioned at the beginning, we went a little bit further and tried to break that down into real, really four contexts. And the dividing line there is we have an impending fracture with limited destruction and potential for healing. We're more likely to choose standard treatment options there. Whereas if we move further to the right where the disease is less responsive, it's a big defect or the joint is at risk, we may up the ante and do a more augmented reconstruction or a segment of reconstruction. And then finally, after surgery, there are things to consider. I mentioned radiation therapy as being critical. And so we generally recommend consideration of radiation therapy in all metastatic patients. Typically we allow the incisions to heal, but depending on the nature of your reconstruction, that may not be necessary depending on uh, the location of the incisions relative to the uh, radiated field. Um, it's important to remember to, to prescribe uh, VT prophylaxis in these patients. Patients with metastatic carcinoma have a significantly elevated risk of blood clots. So we're communicating with the oncologist to choose the most appropriate anticoagulation plan. And then finally, we're dealing with patients who are metabolically challenged. They're going to be they're going to receive radiation and cytotoxic chemotherapy in a lot of cases. So you want to be really kind to the soft tissues. You use the incision you need to use to do the operation you're performing, and and avoid undue trauma to the surrounding soft tissues to promote healing and avoid a complication. So with that, I'll say thank you again for the time. And are we doing questions now? Yes. Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure. But first of all, Matthew, congratulations. This is amazing what you've packed into this tight 23-minute uh, uh, section and uh, beautiful images, and some of them are stunning to me as a spine surgeon, um, the radiolucent implant specifically. Now, here's my question. We just had our 12th annual uh, spine tumor uh, summit at SSF, at over 1,000 people there. And one thing that emerged, again, I asked a simple question, I'm going to ask you it also, is who's actually in charge of an oncologic patient? Most of our spine patients come in Thursday nights and Friday nights. I don't know how it is for you. And um, the surgeons are the only people around. Uh, oncologists usually yeah, don't want to until somebody comes back. So, so 
who is actually in charge? Do we have to wait until a tumor board assembles a month later? Or uh, uh, is it a team sport with, with a sports medicine heavy um, uh, uh, theme here tonight? So just elucidate to the decision making triaging. I think, I think it's a really good question. And I think in, in general, a lot of these patients, the orthopedic surgeon can work up and start that, you know, start that process independently. It just depends on their medical acuity and how quickly we're gonna talk about initiating treatment. Um, I usually wait till I have actionable information to reach out to my medical oncology colleagues. They appreciate that. Um, but there are times when I also need to consider a multi, multi-specialty approach before that. So I don't think it's an easy question to answer in just a few minutes, but in general, we try to collaborate when we can but also be cognizant of the times when we need to gather more information really before the other teams can help and try to try to manage the patient up to that point.